Hey, Ashley. Yeah. Did you just see Ant-Man chasing Jessica Jones while riding BB-8 through Jurassic World as he drag raced Vin Diesel? I don't even know what you're talking about. Well, then it's a good thing that this geek history lesson on the best of 2015 is now in session. And welcome to Geek History Lesson. I'm Ashley Victoria Robinson. And I'm Jason New Year's Baby Inman. Welcome <laughs> to your Mind University. It's a fresh start. It's a fresh year. And you know that this is the freshest of all the podcasts. The podcast that teaches you everything you need to know about a character in pop culture, except for when we do special episodes just like this one. That's right. This week's episode is all about the best of 2015. And before we hop, skip, and jump and BB-8 roll right into this podcast, we first off want to say that this best of 2015 is going to be what we personally thought were the best. Not what is objectively the mm-hmm. best, but what we personally thought was the best. Like, things that we connected to the most. Exactly. Like well, things that mattered the most to us. So uh, if you're looking for the objective list, uh, see you next year. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but if you're not, if you want to hear more of what we thought, what we, I think we have some really interesting choices. I do. I think so, too. I think we got some good ones. And, and first off, we want to just thank all of our listeners for all of 2015 because we had the biggest year ever at the Mine University Woo! and it's nothing but up from here. No, That's right. Nothing but up. So, okay, we have several categories. Many categories. We have comics. Mm-hmm. We have movies. Mm-hmm. We have television. Mm-hmm. We have books. Which Rose we, books. Pro, word books. books. Grown up books. Books with no pictures in them. <laughs> and podcasts. Yeah. And we added a special category this year. Best Geek History Lesson episode. Because <laughs> so we can't get enough of ourselves. Yep, we crawled right up our own butt and we <laughs> did it good. All right. Uh, but I think it's going to be a fun one. I think so, too. I think okay. I'm interested in that one. Yeah, so if this is your first Geek History Lesson, I'm sorry. You're not going to have any idea what's going on in yeah, that category. Go back and listen to the last one. There you go. So let's start it off with the best of 2015 from your Mind University, Professor Ashley Comics. Yes. The funny books. The funny books. Okay. The picture books. Now, we w- must say that we did have a rule in this comics that we had last year. We're going to keep it this year. Mm-hmm. That unless the series has more than three issues, mm-hmm. has to have at least four issues in a year, you cannot count it. Mm-hmm. It means you didn't let me have Gotham Academy last year. Yep. 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 I stopped it. Uh, <laughs> Ashley, for 2015, what do you think is the best comic book? Or graphic novel series, whatever. Uh, what was the best comic book of 2015? The best comic book of 2015 is a series that only has four issues. Oh, you made it right under the wire. <laughs> and uh, is a little known property that you may or may not have heard of. You know, it's it's been around. It's called Archie Comics. Now, this year, Archie Comics got a major reboot written by... Uh, quote, comic superstar Mark Waid. And whoa, 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 is that actually his, is that on his resume now? Comic superstar Mark uh, Waid? That is in the description that I took from the internet. Great. Works and it for is me. drawn by, quote, comic superstar Fiona Staples. Man, Archie, uh, Archie Comics loves the word superstar. They sure, they want you to know how cool they are. So here's a little brief synopsis of it. Change is coming to Riverdale in this can't-miss kickoff to Archie's new ongoing series. Familiar faces return in new and unexpected ways in this must-read series. As the new school year approaches, you'd think Archie Andrews would be looking forward to classes and fun, but nothing is as it seems in the little town of Riverdale. Riverdale. Um, so basically, the Archie reboot... Took, you know, the characters, the situations you know, Archie's... Well, kinda, cause Archie, well, cause Archie's Ar- the popular Archie's, guy. Archie's this, this kid... Who has freckles on his face? Mm-hmm. Basically lives in the 1950s. Yeah, he's got a friend named Jughead. He's got two girlfriends named Betty and Veronica. And they Betty go and to Veronica are always fighting against him. And it's it's basically kind of like romance comics. They've been around forever. It, it is. This is teen romance comic book storytelling. Okay, so why these comics that have been around forever, mm-hmm. even though they rebooted it, mm-hmm. why is this the best comic book of 2015? Uh, because Roberto Aguirre Sacasa, who's the Archie boss, yep. is a cool dude. I think he's been, the creative chief guy. Yeah. He's, uh, the, he's the boss. Creative chief guy. That's what creative we're talking yeah. <laughs> um, He's been making a lot of really bold moves at Archie over the past 10 years. And so this year with the main Archie title... I don't, re- I don't think he's been there 10 years, but keep going. Well, but, you know, whatever. I, got, well, yeah. <laughs> I don't remember how long just, ago, Kevin. We're was. just talking about 2015, Ashley. I know, I know. But but Archie's, <laughs> Archie's a, is a property and is a title that I never would have thought, like, would do really cool things, like bring in a gay character and treat that like it's normal mm-hmm. and do the really scary horror stuff. And they mm-hmm. do scary books. But this Archie reboot, um, the story is essentially 
Archie starts a new year at school. Archie's best friend is Jughead. Archie knows Betty and Veronica and likes them both. Like all the basic tenets of the Archie world are still there. But uh, Mark Waite has brought it into the 2015 or maybe 2014, depending on when he wrote it. Yeah, it's it, contemporary now. World it is. Um, Fiona Staples draws them outside of that kind of house Archie style. They mm-hmm. look like her artwork in Saga. Everyone is very, very kind of sexy and edgy and a little bit too skinny. <laughs> Jughead looks like sexy male Alana, which is really weird. Wait, 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 explain that reference. Alana is the girl in Saga. Thank you. The lead girl. The Thank lead you. girl with the wings mm. and the hair. Um, and I just really like that Mark Waite has taken these characters who really have these silly tropes and he's embraced the tropes, but he has grounded them enough in what we know teenagers to be now. Mm-hmm. And and he does a lot of this through having Archie talk directly to camera. So he's talking to you. You are his vlog or his diary or his whatever, his vine. Um, and that way you get to kind of see... Look at you being soft, trendy with Vine. I, I know. I don't mind. Um, you get to see where Archie kind of bumbles because he's very genuine and he's trying really hard, but he's not very good at it. And, you know, he's given all these characters kind of an edge that I think mm-hmm. makes them A, more entertaining. And I don't know. It's just a more fun reading experience. This is the thing that I connected to the most. It's the thing that... The updating? The updated well, one. What, what specifically about this? Well, like, like, I, like I said, he took... He gave them each a trait that made them feel very... Um, very grounded and very real world so that if the characters feel real, even when you put them in extraordinary circumstances, Mm -hmm. you're willing to buy into these extraordinary, like Archie saves the day by playing guitar in the high school band. And like, that's never going to save the day. It's a total comic Mm -hmm. book romance teen trope, but because he's made him believable and identifiable, I'm willing to go along with that. And I'm willing to let it be okay. And like the stakes behind Archie and Betty's breakup, which carries a lot of the drama of this first arc, is are, are felt by all the other characters in Riverdale. And like that's not something that anyone would really care about. Like if one couple in high school breaks up, but because these characters again are very relatable, they're very down to earth. I'm willing to go with the fact that yeah, there of course there would be this mad ripple effect. I just think it's hmm. very sweet. I think it's very beautiful. It grabbed my attention right off the bat. It was the thing I looked forward to most each month. Um, so yeah, like the Archie reboot, I didn't think initially that there were four issues. I thought there had only been three. So I was really glad to learn that this would four. be and my it, choice for 2015. And it, and, it, and it slipped under the wire. It did. It just snuck in there really, really quick. Um, so yeah, and this is one that I've recommended this to a lot of people, male, female, adults, younger people, and nobody has ever come back and not enjoyed it. In four months. In four months. <laughs> <laughs> so I stand by it as my joy. Cool. <laughs> what is your comics choice? Well, Ashley, when I was thinking about the comics that I needed to proclaim from the mountaintops in 2015, it was tough. It was very tough for me. And the reason why I chose the comics that I did was because they were the two that surprised me and stood out the most. Okay. I have a tie. Of course you have a tie. <laughs> of course I have a tie. And my personal best comics of 2015 are Grayson hmm. from DC Comics and Star Wars Darth Vader. Really? Yes. Now Tell I kn- me. I knew that uh, uh, one of the choices would surprise you, that mm-hmm. Star Wars Darth Vader would surprise me. But uh, let me let me, let me me pitch you on Star Wars Darth Vader. Now, Star Wars Darth Vader, if you don't know, is one of the ongoing Star Wars comic book series published by Marvel, written by Karen Gillan with art by Salvador La Roca. Uh, it started in February. It's already up to issue like 14 because I think they double ship. Yep. Um, it's basically Darth Vader after the Battle of a New Hope. And the Emperor doesn't like him because he, he the Emperor feels that he destroyed the Death Star. And so it's Darth Vader's battle to regain his status while at the same time, tr- time trying to figure out how to kill the Emperor and take his throne. Interesting. At the same time, he's also trying to learn who was the pilot, the Force-sensitive pilot that blew up the Death Star. Now, there's no narration it's a lot of pathos. Salvador Roca is doing some of the best artwork of his entire career. Like, it looks beautiful. I was just actually reading some of it mm-hmm. before this podcast. I never thought I would like a Darth Vader series this much. Because when I was heard about this story, I was like, you can't make Darth Vader a main character. Yeah. You can't do it. Mm-hmm. And... Salvador LaRocca and Karen Gillan have found a way. Like, I'm engaged in this comic book. Even though I know exactly what's going to happen to Vader, yeah. like, I actually want him to win because a lot of this is him going through the underworld and trying to find allies and figuring out ways to get the Emperor. Um, he hires Boba Fett 
to kill the pilot who blew up the Death Star. Oh, wow. And uh, Boba Fett fails, and Boba Fett comes, but there's a brilliant scene. I think it's in issue 13 or 14. 14. I could be wrong. Uh, no, no. It's uh, uh, actually, it's, I'm sorry. I'm way ahead of you. It's actually an issue um, six. Okay. I think. I, I'm sorry. I'm confusing the main Star Wars title and Star Wars Darth Vader. Yeah, so yeah, I'm yeah. getting the numbers <laughs> mixed up. Um, there's an episode where Darth Vader's on the Death Star mm-hmm. and Boba Fett shows up and Boba Fett uh, is like, uh, Darth Vader's like, what do you have for me? And Boba Fett's like, I, I, I have his name. And, and he goes, it's Skywalker. And then Vader says nothing. And then Boba Fett goes, well, I'm leaving then. And just <laughs> walks off. And you just see a close-up of Vader clenching his fist. Mm-hmm. And then it cuts to a shot of the window in front of him. And it goes... And then the window completely cracks and just destroys. Wow. It just, you know, and, and, and you just see Vader go, I have a son. <laughs> and then he immediately in the next issue goes to Tatooine. Oh, cool. And he goes to the Lars homestead. Mm-hmm. Something like that. And, and there it is a thing. Like, again, it's a concept that I never thought would ever work or that I ever care about. And I do care about it. Like there's a touching scene where he finds he finds a protocol droid and he does it like a, a beat where he looks at the face. And then the bounty hunter is like, what do you do? And he's like, nothing. <laughs> you know, um, Karen Gill and I did some research on this. He actually said that he initially um, didn't want to write the series. And that he said before he made up his final decision, he watched A New Hope and he watched Empire Strikes Back because he was like, that was the time period that they wanted this series to take place in. Yeah. And he said that he noticed that in by the time of the Empire Strikes Back, Vader's top dog again. Mm -hmm. And so he was like, what's that journey? And there's three years in between those two movies. Mm -hmm. So he's like, what is the journey that Vader does to get him back to top dog? And he's like, that's the story that I'm telling. Oh, that's cool. Um, Again, this title surprised me. I never thought I would say a Star Wars. And I think it's way better than the normal Star Wars. Oh, yeah. uh, Series. Yeah. Because to me, I'm like with Luke and Han, I'm like, come on. I got the movies. But with Vader, we never got to see Vader star anything. Mm -hmm. So this is like Vader leading the story. Now, my second comic book, Grayson, by uh, Tim Seeley and Tom King, Mm -hmm. uh, of course, is Dick Grayson, Nightwing, former Robin. uh, He's the spy master for Spiral, Mm -hmm. the the weird DC spy agency. And of course, everybody in the DC universe thinks he is dead. Um, It has exceeded my expectations so much because I'm a huge Nightwing fan, as I've said on this series many times before. I never thought that this series would work either. (laughs) Taking Dick Grayson and making him not Nightwing, you're crazy. And Mm -hmm. And it works. And freeing Dick Grayson from the Bat universe has actually allowed him to be closer to it, if you get what I mean. Mm -hmm. Because every time he comes home now, it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. And he's now separated from Batman. So I feel that the younger Robins, like Jason Todd, uh, Tim Drake, and Damian Wayne, actually listen to him more. Interesting. Because he's his own dude instead of, like, Batman number two. Yeah. Um, In fact... I kind of gave the, to Grayson because of Grayson number 12, which was, I thought, one of the best single issues I read the entire year. It is the um, it's the issue where, where everybody in the Bat family finally learns that he's alive after Forever mm-hmm. Evil. And it plays with a lot of the c- conventions of comic book structure. And they do this thing that when every new character finds out that he's alive, they do a one page spread with the character. And then all around them are past dialogue balloons from previous comics. And the coolest thing about it is that all of those little dialogue balloons are from like 40 years of Batman history. They're all real. Mm-hmm. And there's a the best one. My favorite one, of course, is the panel where Damian Wayne uh, Robin mm-hmm. realizes that he's alive because Damian Wayne was Dick Grayson's Robin, yeah, and he and he leaps and bounds into Dick's arms. Oh, I've like, seen, yeah, I've seen that. It's page. one of the. It's like it like brings you a tear. And here's another thing about the Grayson series: it plays a lot with comic book structure, mm-hmm. very a lot. And one of the coolest things they've done is they've introduced into the story this recurring beat of the Clue Master Code. Mm-hmm. Now, this is a code that the Clue Master supposedly used when, when Dick was Robin, and Batman taught it to Dick. And so it's a secret code that they use to talk to each other. Now, Grayson number 12, Dick says a lot of weird stuff throughout the issue. And you're just like, why are you saying this? This is weird. Mm-hmm. And you don't realize till the very end that he's using the Clue Master code on every character because he doesn't want oh. he doesn't want Spiral to hear him, mm-hmm. to hear what he's actually saying. Damien is the only one that realizes it. Damien realizes why he's talking to him. Damien's like, are you using the Clue Master code on me? <laughs> um, now, let me, let me, um, 
Let me tell you what the Clue Master Code is. Okay. The Clue Master Code, and this is not the first issue of Grayson that has done this. There is one issue where they do the entire issue with the Clue Master Code. Oh, wow. The Clue Master Code is you take the first letter of every word that I say, mm-hmm. and you put those together, and it creates a message for you. Oh, yeah, yeah, So, yeah. if I were to give you this message right now, oh, Ashley. Oh, going home lovingly. Roger occupies Camp Kansas. No, yeah, you have to go slower. Okay, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> I'm sorry. Everyone at home can play, <laughs> play along with you. So you can figure out my message. Okay. Going home lovingly. Mm-hmm. Roger occupies Camp Kansas succinctly. Oh. What did I say, Ashley? GHL rocks. Yep. There you go. <laughs> you, you have now learned the Clue Master Code. Nailed it. <laughs> and it's little twists like that that make Grayson way better than I ever thought it would be. Mm-hmm. Um, so Nightwing, I think, is doing right. I want him back as Nightwing, but they're doing fine in Grayson. Grayson surprised me this year with stuff like that. And Star Wars Darth Vader surprised me by making me care about a character that I never really care for. And and prove to me that he deserves a solo series. Those are my two best comic books of 2015. Cool. Did you have any also rands on your list? Oh, you mean like honorable mentions? Yeah. You know, I came very close to putting Fables on my list because uh-huh. Fables ended this year. So why didn't Fables make your list? <sighs> because the last issue was great. Mm-hmm. I loved the ending, but the lead up to it, mm-hmm. the four or five issues before it, were not that great. I kind of think it fell apart. That's fair. Um, I came close to picking Daredevil mm-hmm. because it was the end of Mark, Mark Wade's run. Um, and I came very close to picking Astro City as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, but none of those series had the standout issues that both Darth Vader and Grayson had. Mm-hmm. What about you? What did you? Om- what almost made it? Um, I had Silk as my choice for a really long time. <clears throat> That's me. an interesting choice. Well, because that is a very interesting uh, choice. Silk actually. and Spider Gwen are two books that I have really enjoyed. Post, I almost said Secret Wars, but uh, in fact, post Spider Verse. Oh yeah. But I think Silk holds itself together a little more because it's not as beholden to having to create an entirely new universe. Does it make a difference that it's actually in the Marvel universe? Does that, does that make any difference to it? Well, I just think that they have to work a little less hard because we already know the, the rules and we know who everyone is and we know the roles that they fill. Whereas Got it. in Spider-Gwen, every time you meet a character, even if you know their name, Jason Latour, who's great, has to take the time to teach you about who their place is in this universe because it's a different world than what we know. I think Silk handles the character very effortlessly. I think it's great that it's a character of color and I think it is one of the prettiest books out there right now. So... Uh, Silk was there. Was Go- that your only honorable mention? Uh, no, I have a couple more. Oh, okay. Uh, Gotham Academy was an honorable mention. Um, Just like last year. I love Gotham Academy. I think <laughs> I think the story got a little bit lost this year. It's the all, same reason that We Are Robin didn't make my list. Because, I, again, I really enjoyed it. But I think this, narratively, they mm-hmm. both got a little lost. Um, sometimes because of events. So there's that. Um, and then Rat Queens was also my honorable mention. Oh, Rat Queens. I love Rat Queens. You love rats. And, and two of my favorite artists, Stepion Sajig and Tess Fowler, both worked on the book this year. Nice. Um, but there was a pretty big shipping delay. So uh, I also judged my, my choices on whether or not they came out on time. Nice. Well, let's move on into probably the, the, the part of this podcast that most everybody's looking forward to movies. Dun, 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 dun. Now, this had to be a movie that was released theatrical in 2015. Mm-hmm. Ashley, what was the best movie of 2015 to you? And I know everybody's going to yell at us. I didn't say Star Wars. Did I didn't say, say Star Wars. Everybody's going to yell at us. I didn't say Fury Road. I didn't either. You can direct your tweets to someone who's not me because I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What's, what's your... All right. Uh, uh, please, listeners, stay with us. Uh. Uh, <laughs> no, my pick for the best movie of 2015, um, I think it's going to surprise a lot of people, um, is Pixar's The Good Dinosaur. What? That, really? That's my favorite movie I saw this year. <laughs> Why? Um, tell, give us a synopsis well, and tell us Here's why. your brief synopsis. Um, and you can tell it's from the internet. The Good Dinosaur is a 3D computer animated comedy drama adventure film. Um, set in a world in which dinosaurs never went extinct, the film follows a young Apatosaurus named Arlo who meets an unlikely human friend while traveling through a harsh and mysterious landscape. Aww. So uh, you and I had the opportunity to go see this movie as a screener before it was released. On the Disney lot. Which was both of those things were really cool. Yeah. Um, So I didn't know anything about this movie going into it, except there except that dinosaurs never went extinct. And in this one, the human was the dog, basically. Um, 
No one told me that it was a Western. Yeah, me neither. No one told me that it was about someone's dad. Mm -hmm. And no one told me that I was going to cry for the entire movie. Um, This is the movie that I had the strongest emotional response to this year. Um, And a lot of that is my personal history, my personal life. But I thought it was absolutely beautiful. I thought it was a simple story executed well, which is what Pixar excels in. Yep. I didn't simple think, stories. I didn't think any of the characters were annoying or frivolous, which is one of the reasons why um, Inside Out didn't make my list. And okay. I know a lot of people really liked Inside Out, but whatever. Um, and I think The Good Dinosaur had one of the most well-crafted soundtracks that I heard this year. I love that soundtrack. So I think that even though it is absolutely swarming in male characters, um, I think that this is a is a movie that teaches a lot of really important lessons, whether you are a child watching it or an adult. I think it is well crafted. And I think that the six years that spent in development hell clearly paid off. Yeah, so, it worked somehow. Yeah. And like I said, it's just the the one that stuck with me and hit me the hardest. So and and kind of like you said about Grayson and Darth Vader, like I didn't I was hoping this was going to be a cute movie, mm-hmm. but I didn't I wasn't really hoping that it was going to be a really important movie. And that's what it wound up being. To yeah. Be. You didn't expect to like it that much. Yeah. So The Good Dinosaur is my best movie of 2015. Cool. What is yours? Well, some people say that we may have spent too much money on rescuing Matt Damon over the years. <laughs> he was lost in World War II. Mm hmm. He was uh, lost in the ocean. Mm -hmm. We found him in the ocean one time. And he was also lost as a janitor in Boston. Mm -hmm. He wasn't really lost. We didn't really pay any money. But but he was lost again on Mars this year. (laughs) And we paid through the tooth. And I'm glad we did because it was entertaining as hell. And I'm talking about The Martian, directed by Ridley Scott, uh, written by Drew Goddard, based on the book by Andy Weir, starring Matt Damon. This is is Ridley Scott's best film he's had in probably 10 years. Easily. Oh, easily. Yeah. I thought this film was um, engrossing and capturing. Like, it just never let me go. But basically, uh, Matt Damon is one of the astronauts who goes to Mars. They, he accidentally gets left behind, and he basically has to survive on Mars for more than a year. Four years, I believe. No. Uh, for for, oh, for, for okay. a little bit more than a year uh, um, to... Wait for rescue. And it's engrossing. It's powerful. Matt Damon is by himself most of the film. And the cast, this 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 cast is amazing. I don't even know how they afforded half this mo- the cast of this movie. It has Jessica Chastain, Kristen Wiig, Jeff Daniels, Michael Pena, Kate Mara, Sean Bean, Sebastian Stan, Anxel Henny, and Chiwete... Chai was all I do before. Thank you. The 12, <laughs> 12 Years a Slave guy. Uh, and, and others, like the, the guy who played Kublai Khan. And, oh, yeah, yeah, And Marco yeah. Polo. I love him movie. so much. Um, it's, I thought it was very evenly paced. I didn't think there was a weak scene. I thought it was amazing how... I love these kind of... Um, I love these movies that kind of make you think about these extraordinary circumstances that remind us that like, hey, normal life in stupid minutia is boring and we should just band together and help each other. Because like there's a scene there where China agrees to help us Mm -hmm. because they're just like, hey, it's crazy. This human out there, you know, it's the same thing that happened when Apollo 13 was Mm -hmm. going through all its problems. Um, It I was a big fan of the book. I love the adaptation. I actually can't wait to watch it again. I am going to buy this on Blu-ray. I thought it had amazing soundtrack. It would blow me away if this movie doesn't get a Best Actor, a Best Picture, and a Best Director nomination. Interesting. Because I I think people will forget it, but, like, I think it's solid. I think it's really solid. It's not flashy. It's not flashy at all, but I think it's just solid all around. And there was a solid all-around movie a couple years ago that dominated the Oscars, and that's Argo. Very true. And Martian, I think, I feel Martian fits, taps that same vein as Argo, where you're just like, man. There's, Everything about this was good. There's nothing bad with this movie. There's there's no weak actor, no weak scene. There's no part of it where you get boring. Mm-hmm. You, get, you, get bo- you get bored. <laughs> um, but man, I'll tell you what. I, I love this movie so much that I cannot wait uh, for the sequel, uh, the Jupiter, 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 the Jupiterian, the uh, or the Titan, uh, where Matt Damon gets lost on that planet. Plutonian. I'm, I'm looking forward to that movie. Cool. So that the, the Martian was the best film I saw in 2015, and a lot of people I know were like, "Oh, what the hell? Like Star Wars? Ah, you know, like just relax. 
I went to a different planet in space. It's all good. <laughs> uh, so what were some of your honorable mentions that almost made your pick? Uh, the Martian. And I was pretty sure you were going to pick The Martian, mm-hmm. which is why I left it off my list. Because I also think, I just think, I really like Matt Damon. I think he's tremendous in that movie. Matt um, Damon. I love him. Uh, 99 Homes, which is an independent movie with I have uh, not seen it. Andrew Garfield and uh, Invader Zod. Invader Zod. 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 <laughs> Invader Zod. Zim. Yeah, yeah. General Zod. <laughs> General Zim. Um, which is about the, the housing crisis. And mm-hmm. it's a very personal, very harrowing story. I also think it's some of the best work that Andrew Garfield has done. And mm-hmm. a great reminder that him and Michael Shannon are just really good actors. Yeah. Which I think is something that with both of them, you need to be reminded of. Yeah, true. Um, and then Ex Machina was my was my last. Uh, Ex Machina was in my honorable mentions mm-hmm. as well, uh, specifically for the dance scene. Yep. Oscar Isaac, man. And <laughs> another one that really impressed me this year that I did not expect to like was Kingsman. Mm-hmm. Kingsman was just a lot of fun. And I, and I cannot believe how much I did it. Now, a lot of people were probably yelling at us because they're like, why no Mad Max? Why no Star Wars? Those two didn't connect with me as much as these other films did. I thought those two were fun. Yes. Uh, I, but for me, they didn't tap anything more than being fun. Exactly. There you go. Let's move on into television. Television. Ashley, mm. what did you pick as the best television show of 2015? Now, this again also includes streaming shows. Just for putting it out there. Yeah, my sh- my show's not a streaming show. Oh, I mean, I think it streams. Oh, damn it. Um, I picked The Leftovers Season 2. Hey! Um, And for those who listened last year, The Leftovers was one of my honorable mentions. Um, The Leftovers is set in a world the where... The Leftovers Season 1 was my pick for last year. Yes, it was. Yeah. Um, Was it True Detective? No, it's True Detective. And Leftovers is my honorable mention. I think mention. they were both of our honorable mentions. Yeah, 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 sorry. yeah. Uh, It's set in a world where one third of the world's population has disappeared. Based on the book by Tom Parada, they can't explain why it has disappeared. And this season, they have moved past the book. And they everybody moves to a town called Jarden, Texas, which is colloquially known as Miracle because no one there has disappeared. And that's kind of all I can tell you about the season without spoiling the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Um, it glued me to the television every week. I think that it is a much better pace than the first season. Um, it's, it's it's in a lot of ways more palatable. I don't think mm-hmm. the, the first season's tough. I don't think it's impalatable in any way. Um, it also really allows all of the characters and all the actors to have really beautiful moments. Like, um, I don't know where Justin Thoreau's been hiding all these years. I guess it was in David Lynch movies. No, he's been writing all these years. Uh, yeah, I know. But he has not He has an episode that he stars in almost exclusively called International Assassin. Which is one of the best episodes of television I've seen in a long time. Written by David, Damon Lindelof, won the WGA Award. Mm-hmm. Like, stop everything and go watch that episode. <laughs> Carrie Coon's amazing in it. Um, the Doctor's amazing in it. And surprisingly nude. I just loved everything that they did. I thought this was a really ingenious way to continue this story while introducing new characters like it, it would have been so easy for the show to stagnate just because they'd already done the whole they, they told an entire story they could have just repeated season one they really could have. yeah and they didn't there are still some characters in the show that i could do without yeah yeah but even th- when they showed up in the episodes focus on them even the weakest episodes are better than some of the best episodes of some other shows that i watched so i like this the most i saw the best work out of it and i never got tired of it so it had to be left over season Some very two. powerful emotional moments in mm-hmm. that season. Really mm-hmm. good. I cried. Really good. Yep. What was your television pick? This was a tough one for me again. This mm-hmm. is a really tough one because I thought, um, I was pretty certain you were going to pick Leftovers. Yep. So I, I didn't I didn't want to pick that one. Um, and there was another series that I thought I was going to pick. And then I thought about it just like with the comics, with what affected me more? Like what now am I still thinking about? Mm-hmm. And I think this one's also going to surprise you. Okay. Um, but there was one episode of this television series that I simply cannot get out of my head. And I and I can't get over how brilliant it was. Oh. My pick. I have a guess. <laughs> is Doctor Who. Yeah. As soon as you said that, I was like, oh, it's going to be Doctor, Doctor Who. Doctor Who, specifically the episode uh, Heaven Sent, which was the 11th episode of their, their most current season. Um, if you don't know about Doctor Who, Doctor Cor- Who, of course, is a 2,000-year-old alien who travels around in a blue police box. That's all you need to know. Basically. He, he has weird adventures, and he's played by Peter Capaldi. Now, specifically in the episode Heaven Sent, and I'm going to try to tell you this without spoiling too much, because you got to see this episode. He's trapped in a weird castle. There's no clear way out. But there is a monster in there that if it touches you, you're dead. Except it won't touch you if you confess your sins. Mm-hmm. Now... 
the only way to get out of this castle is to figure out the clues and all stuff like that. But he, the doctor figures out all the clues and then he eventually gets to an impenetrable diamond wall. And that's his only exit out. So his only choice is either confess or die. Mm -hmm. And he decides to just punch his way out. He decides to just hit his fist as hard as he can against this diamond wall because he eventually figures out that he'll get through. And it just goes on with the punching. But now there's a lot more to it than that, but I won't give it away. But the climax of Peter Capaldi, the guy who plays the doctor, trying to beat this monster in mm-hmm. a giant metaphor for life and death is honestly the most powerful thing I've seen on television this year. And I keep listening to the soundtrack of the episode over <laughs> and over and over. I mean, just listen. The episode begins with this monologue and I want I want I want I want to read it for you. Okay. As you come into this world, something else is also born. You begin your life and it begins a journey towards you. It moves slowly, but it never stops. Wherever you go, whatever path you take, it will follow. Never faster, never slower, always coming. You will run, it will walk. You will rest, it will not. One day you will linger in the same place too long. You will sit too still or sleep too deep. And when too late, you rise to go. You will notice a second shadow next to yours. Your life will then be over. I think that is some powerful writing. And again, I cannot tell you about the <laughs> twist, but like Heaven Sent was so amazing to me. And I cannot believe it's it's a one man show. It's Peter Capaldi just by himself mm-hmm. talking to walls and he and he and he kills it. There's like an ongoing theme here. I don't know if you noticed, like Martian was also a, a lonely man. I was also going to say that if you think if you know the episode International Assassin from the Leftovers and you know the episode Heaven Sent, similar. they're kind of similar. They're very similar. They're very similar. Um <laughs> We like stories about people trapped alone. <laughs> now, the rest of the season nine of Doctor Who is full of a lot of fun two-parters. There's a fun two-parter about the Daleks. Um, in the finale, you get to see the original TARDIS set again from the 1963. Mm-hmm. And it's basically this season is full of Peter Capaldi Kamal- cementing himself, in my opinion, as one of the strongest doctors out there. Easily, yeah. Um, he's basically angry Obi-Wan Kenobi, and it's really awesome. Um, but Heaven Sent, they put the script out online, and I've read the script. It is one of the best written things I've read in a long time. And and I I literally could go watch that episode now and still be as just like slapped across the face, like amazing with that thing. And so that's why I had to pick Doctor Who season nine as what I thought was the best television show of 2015. Now, my honorable mention that almost made it on here was Daredevil. Mm-hmm. I actually thought you were going to pick Daredevil. I, I, I thought so, too. Um I love Daredevil. Daredevil is my favorite Marvel hero. I love the series. The fight scenes are great. Daredevil had no moment that was as great as Heaven Sent Mm -hmm. and the doctor in that wall. Um, So that's why I had to get. And then Leftovers is also my honorable mentions as well. Um, And then as well, um, Ash vs. Evil Dead has been a lot of fun. It's true. What were some of your honorable mentions? Um, my, I only have two honorable mentions, and one of them is a Netflix original show called Making a Murderer. Ooh, we've only watched two episodes. That's good. I, with three episodes? Sure, there you go. Um, it's basically serial, but it's, it's, a visual documentary. Yeah, it's, 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 it's fancy true crime. Um, I would highly recommend checking that out. Um, and then this year, for the first time, I watched um, most of MASH in order. And even though it's not a current show, <laughs> it, it, it very much affected me. So go yeah. watch MASH. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, kudos and geek history. Lesson. Life well done to Wayne Rogers, who just passed oh, away. Trapper John himself on MASH. My favorite character. Oh, cool. I don't think we had really good choices. But when, when as soon as you said that International Assassin is very... Very close to Heaven yeah, Sent. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was thinking about it, and I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> Heaven Sent just had better music. Well, maybe. <laughs> you like that Leftovers theme song an awful lot. I do. <laughs> <laughs> and enough about liking theme songs. Let's move on into books, prose books, books with no pictures. Grown up books. Grown up books. Actually, what was... Now, for this one, the book didn't have to be published in 2015. It didn't. But it was just a book that we read during mm-hmm. the time of 2015. What was a book that just grabbed you? Well... If you remember this episode last year, my favorite podcast was Welcome to Night Vale. And this year, they made a book. Hey, <laughs> look at that. Um, from the creators of the popular, wildly popular Welcome to Night Vale podcast comes an imaginative mystery of appearances and disappearances. That is also a poignant look at the ways in which we all struggle to find ourselves, dot, 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 no matter where we live. 
What I really like about the Welcome to Night Vale book is that it takes three, I mean, what's smaller than tertiary? Atomic? Bit part characters. Like these three names that you've heard on the show a couple of times. Sure. Um, like they're not supporting characters, they're not secondary characters, not even tertiary characters. They're very small characters. And it tells you all about their lives and they go on this adventure and they intertwine. And I really like the focus on different aspects of the show because the podcast obviously mostly focuses on Cecil because he's the one giving you the podcast. Yeah. Um, but they throw in enough of the other details like um, the jokes and the other characters and the phraseology. And Cecil does have some chapters that you never feel like you're just wandering aimlessly through this world for the mm-hmm. sake of filling out a book. I don't really like the idea that you have to read the book in order to understand the podcasts that come after it. Mm-hmm. But that is a marketing Could decision. Could I read this book? I don't listen to Welcome to Night Vale. Could I read this book? I don't think so. Ah, oh, damn it. Because it is very stylistic. That would be on my worst list. And the, <laughs> and the type of humor and stuff, I think you have to at least... I don't think you have to be up to date, okay. but I think you have to be familiar with like, okay, this is the kind of storytelling that we're going with. Okay. So this is definitely a book written for the fans of the series. Understood. Um, but I'm a fan of the series, so it totally worked for me. And hey. It's probably the most imaginative prose book I read this year. Cool. What is yours? Well, I wanted to pick The Martian because I did read The Martian this year before <laughs> the movie, but I felt it was a little bad to pick The Martian and The Martian. Uh, so I actually picked a book that helped us out during the production of The Red Shirt Diaries, the web series that we do. Mm-hmm. And that is These Are the Voyages, season one by Mark Cushman. Ah. Um, These Are the Voyages, it, it uh, talks about Star Trek, the original series, season one, and it has unpublished uh interviews and recollections from actors, directors, producers, production crew, writers, and it tries to capture every perspective Mm -hmm. of creating an episode. So let's say The Man Trap, which was like the third episode produced. Mm -hmm. um, It starts out where it takes you through all the different drafts. So it's like, okay, this was oh, cool. this is what draft one was. This is what draft two was. This is the notes that Robert Justman gave. And it, and it, told, and it tells it in a narrative fashion so it's not boring. Mm-hmm. And then it sh- takes you through the seven-day shooting schedule. Mm-hmm. And then it takes you through the editing schedule when it actually aired and the special effects. And just learning about a lot of this stuff, like how different draft one to draft four was. Mm-hmm. And then also like how long their da- they're these like... 14, 15 hour days were like for all these actors and how hot the sets were and where they I mean, filmed. everyone's pretty shiny in Star Trek. Uh, yes. And then and, and then like the crazy things like the lighting guy, the cinematographer who created TOS's visual style mm-hmm. had never lit a television show before. <laughs> and it's amazing because you think about that show. We watch that show right now. And we are like, that's some damn good lighting. Yeah, like, for, that's, for sure. That's the standard. We had that conversation. In fact, yeah, that guy. <laughs> Had no idea what he was doing. He was just like, I think this looks pretty. Good job, that guy. Uh, I, I can't remember. I, I, know, I know fans are screaming at us right now. I, I didn't get his name down. Uh, but he's a very amazing, he's an amazing cinematographer. And he did the stuff like the light across Kirk's eye mm-hmm. that J.J. Abrams aped in the 2009 movie. Everyone's got a halo. Yeah, ha- a strong, hard backlight. But just learning stuff like that and the fact that the reason like the man trap was first Mm -hmm. was because it was actually supposed to be the Corbinite maneuver, Mm -hmm. but the special effects weren't done because they didn't know how to do the giant ship that the Enterprise. Oh, interesting. So all this interesting stuff and and, and, and it gives you a lot of respect for certain people. Like like I gained a lot of respect for Bill Shatner. And I know that Interesting. I know that William Shatner a lot of people are like, Oh, that guy's an asshole and whatever. But when you read this book um, Mark Cushman did a lot of interviews with the original crew. Mm-hmm. Like there's a there's a there's another man. He's the guy who always had the clacker in the and he's in mm-hmm. all like the behind the scenes photos. Oh yeah yeah yeah. And, and, and um, he talks about how how William Shatner was the class clown of the set. That he was the one that kind of took the lead and was kind of like we got to make these long days fun. Mm-hmm. And 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 so he, he was truly a leading man. Yes, and so he thought he he was a fun guy, and like it, it was interesting. You read different reports about who didn't like him and who did, but I gained a lot of respect for Bill Shatner because I learned, oh, he wasn't an asshole from the beginning. He actually did come into this project trying to make it the best it could be. That's really cool. Um, and you and then you learn certain things like how close him and Leonard were, and like and how close like uh, Chekhov and and Sulu were. Mm-hmm. And it, there's a, there's a book for every season. And, and and there's rumors that eventually he's going to do the movies and the TNG. I mm-hmm. hope these are fascinating books. If you if even if you don't like Star Trek, it's a fascinating look into 1960s television production. Cool. From every angle, it's a great read. These are the voyages, season one by Mark Cushman. 
Given to us by Mike Clark. Yes, <laughs> we're given by Mike Clark. All right, now let's get into our second to last uh, caveat of 2015. The best podcast that is not a podcast produced by uh, anybody in the Major Spoilers Network, Frog Pants Network, any friends or family so, of Geek the show. and Sundry, like anyone that we know, yeah. we, can, we yeah. don't touch it. We don't give it to one of our friends. Because uh, uh, we don't want our friends fighting. <laughs> what's What's the podcast that you really, and again, this podcast did have to come out in 2015. Okay, um, this is going to take a little bit of explanation. Uh-oh. So the podcast that I chose for my best of 2015 is a podcast called Undisclosed. So, remember cereal last year that everybody loved so much? Remember that cereal joke I did on last year's podcast? Yep. Amazing. Uh, about Adnan Syed, well, the Undisclosed podcast is presented by members of his legal team. Uh-oh. Uh, so it is very much pro-Adnan. Their stance is that he is innocent. Um, I'm not sure I agree with that stance, mm-hmm. but that is what the podcast is framed with and they break everything down the way a lawyer would building a case. They talk about the ongoing developments. So... I was really interested in Serial. I was really interested in that case. And then this, for me, was a very well-researched, very well-produced continuation of that. By his lawyers. By his lawyers. So it is a little more dry. There's a lot less storytelling in it than there is in Serial. But they talk a lot more about um, the legalese and what this means if you're going forward with a defense case and how you would present this to a court or how when this was presented to a court, it actually violated this, this, and this statute. So it's kind of like kind of like the nerd class for serial fans um i really like it like i said i don't know if i necessarily agree with everybody's stance on the show Mm -hmm. but it fills that serial sized void that i have (laughs) in my life since the new episodes didn't start coming out until three weeks ago those bastards So, yeah, what's your podcast choice? Well, Ashley, i think when you talk about what my podcast choice for 2015 is there's only one choice you can make and that is well, wait, no, no, no. <laughs> what are you doing? I'm not. It's the, it. When you think about a podcast, Ashley, there's only this. This joke's not working. <laughs> it's actually the Andy Daly pilot, pilot podcast project. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's why. Um, if you, my podcast is a podcast by Earwolf. It's hosted by Andy Daly, who also uh, does the show Review. He's on Mad TV. He's been on a bunch of Eastbound and Down. But he does this Andy Daly podcast pilot project. He did a season in 2014. He so far hasn't done another season. The idea is that Kim and Matt Gorley have opened it up to all these people who have podcasts everywhere. And they're like, you send us a pilot. If we like your pilot, we'll play it. The trick is, is that Andy Daly and Matt Gorley and a bunch of other improv- improvisers play all the characters. And so mm-hmm. we get a whole bunch of uh, uh, fake podcasts and and they're all improv based hilarious like, like i have not laughed as much at anything this year as i did this podcast like it starts out with the wit and wisdom of the west with dalton wilcox who is supposedly the poet laureate of the west uh there's all there's hail satan with chip gardner is episode two the travel bug with august lint that's my favorite one <laughs> rocking and a rolling with wolfman hot dog now so andy daly is all these characters and like wit and wisdom there's these these compunctions where like dalton wilcox is is, is a lot, the whole podcast is about him bringing his agent on the episode so he can bitch at the agent that his book is not selling. Yeah. <laughs> and then like hot dog Wolfman is all about like how why he's mad about that. He's not been in the water skiing hall of fame and, yeah. it, and it becomes a debate about water skiing. And then there's a get fit pocket. It, it's just, if you're looking for a podcast, it's going to be different every time. Now there's only like eight episodes, I believe. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I've heard that he's probably not going to do a season two, which is, ah, no. But if you want to laugh out loud and have a completely different experience every time, there each episode is about an hour and a half. They have musical guests in there, which mm-hmm. are pretty amazing. And a lot of guest stars like Paul F. Tompkins shows up. Scott Ackerman shows up. Um, it is the funniest podcast I have heard probably my entire life. The Andy Daly Podcast Pilot Project came out in 2014. But it is still worth listening to. That was my best podcast in 2015 because I listened to it in 2015. Cool. There you go. And I'm sorry I'm not as fun as Andy, fun, funny as Andy Daly and I ruined that whole joke. Aww. All right. Now let's go to the last section of our best of 2015. Uh, probably the most self-indulgent in, uh, uh, <laughs> section. The best geek history lesson episode of 2015. Ashley, mm-hmm. what did you think was our best episode in 2015? What's the episode number and what's the, what's the name of it? 
Oh, I don't have the episode number. <laughs> uh, this uh, this already. Well, then you go first. I, I know what's going to be my worst episode of Geek History Lesson <laughs> next year. Number ninety five. <laughs> um, my episode is episode seventy five. Fantastic Four Part One. Oh well, then mine is seventy five and seventy six. Oh, is that what you're gonna pick? Yeah. <laughs> uh, wh- why were you gonna pick that one? Um, because probably selfishly, my favorite geek history lessons are the ones when I don't know jack about the character, and then you come in and teach me something, and then I get really interested in like in that character, in that character, yeah, yeah or I understand like, oh, I get like why people care about the Fantastic Four now. Um, and I think that. Those episodes, I mean, I put them together because it's basically one long episode. It is. It's a very, very long episode. Um, you know, I think <laughs> part one, part two of the Fantastic Four. I think not only do you do a really great job at breaking down an incredibly complicated character history, because um, all the old ones are, and all the ones with the most science fictiony ties mm-hmm. are the most complicated ones. I think you can also in in episodes like that or Nightwing or Hawkeye. Um, you can really tell how passionate you are about those characters, and for me, that makes it a more interesting like experience sitting opposite you on the oh, mic. Look at you. <laughs> I was gonna, say, I, I picked it because I love that it introduced the idea of Submariner Studios, the movie studio ran by Namor. <laughs> and I, we still get tweets about that. Yeah, and then I also love that I like. I think by the end of the first episode, I convinced you that. The Fantastic Four were awesome and valid. I started reading the Mark Wade run. Yes, and I also heard uh, later from my my little brother, who also sometimes listens to this podcast, uh, Matt. Hello out there, if you're listening to this episode, that he actually gained an appreciation for the Fantastic Four and wanted to listen to it as well. Look at you converting people from Marvel. I'm glad that we. It's so interesting <laughs> that we both picked our, our 75th episode. Yeah. That's awesome. I had no idea what you were going to pick, so. Uh, but I knew immediately that those were what I was going to Oh, is that where you're going to. Yeah. Was Nightwing this year? I have no idea. No, Nightwing was last year. Oh, damn it. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I looked at this year. I almost picked. Oh God, I can't remember. There was. I looked through. I literally looked through the whole list. Mm-hmm. And I, I, there was a couple of that I kind of picked, but then I thought Fantastic Four just for the simple fact of Submariner. I Studios. thought about House Stark for a minute. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, there you go. There's our full list of best of 2015. We're going to be back next week with more episodes teaching you everything about a character of pop culture. If you want to hear more Geek History Lesson, including Geek History Lesson Extra, our extra podcast that is exclusive, it's on our Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash jawin. That's J-A-W-I-I-N. And if you donate at the $5 level, you get a new and extra Geek History Lesson episode every week. That's what? Geek History Lesson Extra. This week, we're going to be talking about the worst of 2015. Yeah. Yeah, so you're going to be hear that episode over there. <laughs> so go ahead. All that support helps us create more podcasts and more content for you this year. And we got a big year plan for you guys. So thank you guys so much for sticking around. Ashley, if they want to suggest future episodes... For this podcast, characters and also ideas like the best comic books for comic book fans to read, which a lot of people listen to. So thank you guys for that. Yeah, thank you for the people who went on and bought our recommendations and then yeah. told us what you thought about them. That was where, really cool. Where can they do that on social media? They can do that at www.geekhistorylesson.com. That is a Tumblr. All the asks are open. You can also do that at facebook.com slash geekhistorylesson. You can find me on Twitter and YouTube at Jawin, J-A-W-I-I-N. And Ashley, where can they find you on Twitter? You can Find me at Ashley V. Robinson. Yeah, go there on our Twitters and tell us, everybody, what you thought about our choices and whether you're really, 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 really mad that we didn't include Mad Max. I'm not going to say the other one. Uh, <laughs> I liked it. I liked the other one, but I just didn't think it was the best. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. So just, really, just, just, okay. Just chill, everybody. All right. So cool. Um, here's, <laughs> here's to a happy 2016, guys. Thank you so much for listening. Let's create some more awesome moments in, uh, maybe we can do the 16 best things of 2016. That's so many things. It's a lot of things, but I we'll see. better start my list now. Yeah, you better start your list right now. Thank you guys all mo- so much for listening. You can find us on iTunes and Stitcher. Go subscribe and SoundCloud, soundcloud.com slash Geek History Lesson. Thanks for listening. I'm Jason. I'm going to be an old man next year. Inman. I am Ashley Victoria Robinson. And as we close out this first lesson of 2016, Ashley will give us an invocation that will lead us on into the year. Go ahead, Professor Ashley. Class is dismissed. That that was very simple, but thank you. (laughs) 